Joshua in chapter number 7. I love the book of Joshua. Joshua is a, a man among men. He is amazing. Faithful, faithful, faithful. When other people were not having faith, Joshua was showing himself faithful. Quite a man of God. And he was serving under Moses for many years, even when others messed up, even when his uh, everyone in his generation would, was just giving up, giving out, giving in. And uh, he and Caleb stayed faithful. He stood by Moses, the man of God, and uh, it was pretty amazing. So in Joshua chapter number 10, let me just set the stage for you. Moses is dead. The children of Israel have just entered into the promised land. They have defeated Jericho. God did that. And then they go up against a little town called Ai. Ai is so little that they only get two letters. And uh, it's a small town. And they even say, like, we don't need to send everybody. That's ridiculous. Well, let's send at the most 3,000. He said, if you think at the most 3,000, we'll send all 3,000. So he sends 3,000 people, and they go there, and they go against Ai, and Ai whips them. Ai tears them up. And so the men of Ai chase them back, and they kill 36 people. They lose 36 men, 36 dads, 36 brothers, 36 sons. And so they lose all of these men in this battle, and they didn't need to lose them. Joshua goes to the Lord in prayer. So, which seems like a really good thing. But we're going to start in verse 10, and we're going to see where God actually tells him to stop praying. Stop praying. And I want to preach from that place. Let's go to Joshua chapter number 7, verse number 10, and we'll begin reading there. This is God's answer to Joshua's prayer. He says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing and have stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with them, uh, with you anymore, except you would destroy the accursed thing from among you. Up. Sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you for your word. And Lord, it is shocking and surprising that you would ever tell anybody not to pray. And yet we see it very clearly here. This is not a time to pray. It's a time to take action. Lord, I pray that you would bless the reading and preaching of your word in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. I want to preach this morning uh, on a new phrase that we've all just learned in the last 10 weeks. And that's called flattening the curve. Flattening the curve. Uh, when the spike of death is on its way up, the goal is everybody do everything you can to flatten that curve where we don't have a constant increase of more problem and more problems and more problems. And so if we can effectively flatten the curve, then we can get back to what we were doing before. Then we can get back to life. And so they've been telling us to flatten the curve, flatten the curve, flatten the curve. 
Well, can I tell you, there is a spiritual way to flatten the curve as well because what's killing people around the world is not necessarily the coronavirus. Uh, it wasn't the Ebola before this. It wasn't the H1N1, the bird flu, the swine flu, the Spanish flu. Everywhere flu flu. We've had diseases forever. We're going to have more diseases. And uh, they're going to take some people out. It's going to uh, hurt people. It's going to harm different people. But what's really destroying the people in this world is sin. Sin is what's destroying the world. And so Joshua, he's crying out to God because they lost a battle. And it, it should have been easy. Should have been easy. 36 men are die, dead and they look foolish. They look foolish in front of their enemies. Not only is it going to be easier for the men of Ai to come out with boldness against them next time, but it's going to be uh, easier for the next enemy and the next enemy and, and, and the, the Hivites and the Ammonites and the Amorites and all the other ites. It's going to be easier for them to come out against God's people because God's people are failures. God's people don't have the power of God. They're not following the leadership of God. They're not being obedient to God. And they don't have the blessing of God. Guys, we live in a world that looks very much like I just described. We live in a world where it doesn't look like the good guys are winning. It doesn't look like God's people have the power of God, the blessing of God, the leadership of God. We are not following what God wants us to do. And because of that, we have lost the blessing. And hey, you might as well suck it up and get ready because just like God says uh, there in verse number 12, he says, and neither will I be with you anymore. God, we can't ask God to be with us if we're not willing to be faithful. Yeah, amen. We cannot expect God. I say it all the time. God's not going to answer the prayers that we refuse to pray. He is not going to bless the work that we refuse to do. He is not going to bless the, the offerings that we forget to give or we neglect to give or we refuse to give. He's not going to bless the missionaries that we refuse to support. Listen, we have to be obedient to what God wants us to do if we are going to have the blessings of the power of God. God said in verse number 10, it ain't time to pray. What are you doing on your face praying? It ain't praying time. It's doing time. And it's time to get up and take care of the work of God and do the will of God. It's time to get off our faces and off our backsides and off our excuses and just simply be obedient. You don't have to pray about whether or not to be obedient. You don't have to pray about whether or not it's okay to sin. We know it's not okay to sin. We know we're supposed to do God's will. You don't have to pray about that. Just do it. Israel had sinned. They had disobeyed God. They had stolen from God. God said when you go into Jericho, you're not going to have to do anything to knock down that wall. I'm going to take care of that for you. But don't take any of the stuff. That's mine. Don't take any of my stuff. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and declare it all accursed. So we know the story of a man named Achan had picked up some, uh, some gold and some silver, a Babylonian garment, and he had taken it and hidden it in his tent. I don't know if his wife knew about it. I don't know if his kids knew about it. But his family is about to be rounded up, stoned to death, and burned with everything they own. Why? Because none of us lives and dies unto ourselves. Everything we do, good or bad, has a major effect on our family and the people around us. If you fail, you're going to drag other people into your failure. But when you succeed and you do right, you will draw people into your success and into the blessings of God. When you do right and God blesses it, listen, God is going to see that and bless that and other people will see that and it becomes a testimony. And when we do right, God doesn't just bless our life, but he blesses those around us with an example, with opportunity, with blessings from on high. In verse number 12, it's so hard. He says, therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies 
but they turn their backs. Do you know, friend, uh, right now we've been making our Preach and Mojo videos, and all of the armor has to do with the front of your body. You know, God's got protection for you as long as you're facing the fight. God's got protection for you as long as you're facing the battle. But if you're a stinking coward and you turn and run, your backside's unprotected. And that's what happened here with the children of Israel. They got their backside kicked. They weren't right with God. They had a problem. Sometimes we wonder, why well, I don't understand why things is going bad. I'll tell you why, honey. Either it's a test from God that you need to uh, pass or it is rebuke from God and you need to realize and recognize that only you and God know. People want to come and ask questions. I don't know the answer to your questions, but you do. You know if you're involved in sin. You know if you're displeasing the Lord. You know if God's upset with you, and you know why God's upset with you. Don't play ignorant. We, we play, we dummy up around our friends, our Christian friends. Well, I just don't know. It must be a test. Okay, we'll pass it then. Sure does look like a lot of other tests you've had. Why do you keep failing these tests? I tell kids, they're like, I hate school. They're like, what grade are you in? Third grade? You hate third grade? You act like you love it. Because you ain't trying to pass to get out of it. You love it so much, you're going to go through third grade again. If you really hate it, pass it and get out of there. Some of our seniors trying to finish up school, they're like, Oh, I hate school. I don't want to work on it. I'm like, you act like you love school. You act like you love school so much you ain't ready to leave because we're about to repeat this whole year again. You're going to drag it out another year, honey. And Christians are the same way all the time. They're like, oh, I hate this test I'm going through. I hate this problem I'm going through. Let me just keep failing so I can do it over and over again. Giving up, giving out, and giving in ain't no way to get through the test. You're going to have to get a passing grade if you want to move on. You're going to have to master this subject if you want to move on. I wasn't a big fan of certain subjects in school, namely most of them. But I know this, I had to master those jokers and get out of there. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even want to go to Bible college. My preacher made me go to Bible college. I went under duress. But I'm glad I went. And when I was there, I was like, man, I can't drag. Some of these guys have been here six, seven, eight years. Some guys are in and out, taking a few classes, taking 10 years. I can't do that. I can't do that. I needed to get in and out as quickly as possible, so I, I had to have so many classes. I had 17 extra hours. No, I, had, I took three extra classes just to make sure everything was going to even out. I, need, I, I got nine extra hours. It wasn't because I was super spiritual. It was because I was ready to get done. And I also realized that I needed everything to move forward in my life. I needed every bit of the training. Can I tell you, you might be tired of what you're going through today. Why don't you just try to master it? Why don't you flatten the curve? Why don't you flatten the curve? You're just like, I'm getting killed, preacher. You don't understand. I'm getting killed on this thing. Flatten the curve, baby. Flatten the curve. Stop sinning. Get right with God. Flatten that curve. And maybe the tests will go away. And the trials will go away. And the persecution will go away. And the punishment will go away. And the consequences will go away. And the after effects will go away. Hey, maybe you'll get the blessings to start coming. And the blessings to start coming. And the blessings to start coming. And the blessings to start coming. Flatten the curve and watch what happens. God said, not only are you a loser right now, Joshua, you fit to be a loser forever because I ain't going to bless with you and I ain't going to be with you anymore. As long as that accursed thing is around. So why don't you get up off your face and stop complaining to me about what's wrong and fix the problem and start doing right. Sin in this world is getting worse and worse. We live in a world full of perverts. We live in a world where people are so confused they don't know what bathroom to go to. We live in a world where people kidnap people, torture people, hurt people for their own sicko satisfaction. We live in a world where people got to get high and get drunk just so they can cope. Can you imagine that we live in a 
country and a world that's so wicked and warped that they outlawed people meeting inside church buildings, but you could go meet at the liquor store? That's a warped world, man. They say, yeah, but people got to have it. Well, I got to have God. Well, yeah, but I've got to, I've got to, my mental health is at stake. Well, what about saved people? I'm telling you, man, we, we need to meet together. It's commanded that we meet together. I bet you never get this country shut down again. They messed it up the first time. I bet they don't ever get it shut down again. Nobody's going to put up with this junk. It's a bunch of nonsense. But the sin in this world is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And we see it. But I'm telling you, listen, we say that's the liberals' fault. And the other side is say, no, that's them conservatives' fault. I say they're both right. The left wing and the right wing are flying the same, sink, the same stinking dirty bird and it ain't helping none of us. The only thing that's going to save us is Jesus Christ. We can't keep depending on the government to save us. They can't protect us. They can't even agree with one another. Meanwhile, they're sitting up in their lofty mansions, sucking on high-dollar ice cream, hiding in their place, telling us we can't protect ourselves while they have armed security guards surrounding them, making deliveries to them, and they're receiving all of our money. Hey, they're still taxing us all the way, taking our money for their income, but telling us we ain't allowed to go out and earn our own money. That's a bunch of puke is what that is. But it ain't their fault. It's our fault because we let it happen. It's our fault because we're not right with God. It's our fault because in a world that's full of sin, Christians have inched over and inched over and inched over. What we've done is, over the years, we've said, oh, I will never stand there. That's where wicked people stand. And as the wicked has gotten more wicked... We've moved over with them, and now they're more wicked, but so are we. And then they've moved over, and they've gotten more wicked, but so are we. And now they're more wicked, and so are we. And meanwhile, here we are standing where we used to complain that they were standing. That's our fault. Listen, lost people do what lost people do. Sinners do what sinners do. Warped people do what warped people do. Christians, bless God, ought to be doing what Christians ought to be doing. That's our job. That's our time. We've got to flatten the curve. If Christians would get right with God, we could flatten the curve. If everybody who claimed that they were Christian would stand up and start living like it, and looking like it, and smelling like it, and dressing like it, and talking like it, watching like it, and listening like it, and loving like it, I believe we'd flatten the curve. But until then, we'll have to shut our mouths and stop complaining about what the world's doing. I don't remember where that verse is located, but it says that judgment should start at the house of God. Why are we worried about what the world's doing when we got a stinking beam hanging out of our eye and we're not praying like we should, we're not serving like we should, we're not witnessing like we should, we're not praising God like we should, we're not lifting him up like we should. Hey, we're not we're proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ like we should. We have become fat and lazy when it comes to the things of God. We lay out on the spiritual things more. Listen, if we laid out on the worldly things like we lay out on the spiritual things, every one of us would be fired from our jobs. Every one of us would be in, in, in on poverty. But that's how a lot of people try to operate. That's why a bunch of Christians stand around looking for some Christian food stamps, looking for some Christian welfare. All because they ain't willing to work and serve and earn the blessings of God. We are saved not by good works, but we are saved unto good works. It is our job to do good work for the Christ. This whole situation that we find ourselves in, friend, is a perfect opportunity for a reset. People got spiritual right after September the 11th. People got spiritual, man. They were praying together. They were praying on radio. They were praying on TV. Nobody complained about it. But today, if you try to say anything about Jesus Christ, they want to complain about it. Brother Jason was preaching the other day and reminded me of an event where we went to, he was, uh, 
going to open up the, the Dallas County Commissioner's Court in prayer. They asked us to come and pray and then told us not to mention the name of Jesus. Well, who in the world are we supposed to be praying to? See, I don't expect the world to understand what we're doing. I don't expect the world to understand what we're supposed to do. But bless God, we ought to. We ought to. That's our responsibility. That's our place. That's our wheelhouse. That's where we're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Lost people do whatever they're going to do. Our job is just try to get in their way while they're on the way to hell. Meanwhile, they're trying to drag us out of church, drag us out of prayer, drag us out of our safety area, drag us out of our Bible. This is a time for a reset. This is not a time to drop on our face like we're confused like Joshua was. In those verses, you can go back up to verse 1 and read all the way down there to verse number 10 when God told him to get up off his face. But he's like, Lord, we don't know what's going on. Why'd you bring us out here, Lord? Our enemies are fitting to get us. No, your enemy ain't fitting to get you unless you let him. See, the thing is, it's not a time to pray like we're confused. It's time for us to pray like we're committed. Like we're actually committed to God. Instead of going, oh, Lord, we don't understand the coronavirus. And, oh, Lord, should we shut down? And should it be more weeks or six months or six years? Or let us all just die of starvation at home, Lord. What are we going to do now? No, we ought to say, Lord, our nation is wicked. Our nation and this world are wicked and sinful. And our church and our people and Christianity at large has not done enough to be a shining light in a dark world. We have not done what we're supposed to do. We've not been where we were supposed to be. We've not given what we were supposed to give. We've not prayed like we should pray. We've not witnessed like we should witness. We've not served like we should serve. We've not loved like we should love. And it's our fault, Lord. It's our problem. And Lord, I'm going to change. And I'm going to be different. And I'm going to make some change in my family. And I'm going to start. And I'm going to lead our church. And I'm going to lead our people. And I'm going to make a difference. That's how we ought to be praying. That's how we ought to be praying. A prayer of committal. A prayer of determination. That's what God's looking for from His people is some commitment and dedication and determination. We need to flatten the curve. Sin is destroying the world and Christians are uplifting into a bunch of puke hip-hop in their, in their church buildings and letting the world around them die and go to hell. Puke on that. We have the privilege and the opportunity and the blessing to meet together, to get encouraged and challenged by the Word of God. But it does nothing if we do nothing with it. Our job is to go out into a lost and dying world and let the light of Jesus Christ shine through our lives and through our efforts and through our blessings. They can't see that if we won't do that. They can't see our blessings if we don't have any blessings. We can't be a blessing if we haven't been blessed. You can't feed nobody if you don't know how to cook. What I'm saying is we need to flatten the curve. We need to get in the way. I think one of the problems is we got a bunch of perpetrators in our church that aren't even saved. You talk to people about going out witnessing, and they're like, well, I don't know how to witness. I'm like, tell people how you got saved. Uh, uh, I can't. Well, what do you mean you can't? Why come you can't? Did it happen? Did you get saved? Do you remember? You say, it's a long time ago. I don't really remember. I remember a lot of big events from way back. I remember big events from more than 40 years ago, 45 years ago. You say, you're only 48. I remember being three years old, four years old. I remember where I got this uh, scar right here on my head. My kid sister sitting right over here in her car. She don't remember. She was a baby. And the baby was home from the hospital and the baby was crying. I was watching the Lone Ranger and I got out and I started running. I was like, the baby's crying. The baby's crying. I was running and I was half riding a horse, half just fat kid running. And uh, I mean, I looked back over and by the time I turned back, I caught the corner of a wall right there. Next thing I know, my mama was outside with me wrapped in a, wrapped in a towel compressing the, uh, the blood, trying to get the blood to stop. We had to get a ride to the hospital. We didn't have a car. 
and uh, there at the house. My, my, our dad had it at work. And so, man, I was bleeding all over the place. Somebody had to take me to get some stitches. You know, I don't remember the stitches. I don't remember the stitches. But I remember the event that caused that scar for the rest of my life. I remember being a little kid and getting certain gifts. I remember being a real young kid and getting the Tyco nightclub, Daredevil Jump Racetrack. We didn't get a lot of gifts. I remember my mama having to go to the grocery store and begging the manager to let her buy Christmas for us with food stamps. And he just couldn't do it. My mom figured it out. And so she bought a bunch of groceries on food stamps and then turned around and gave the groceries back. And they gave her the money in cash so that she could buy a, few, a couple of little toys. My sister got a couple of dolls and I got a, a little battery operated, little nothing, $2.50 little car toy. But I remembered because I was watching my mama make the effort. I remember my stepdad beating the snot out of a peeping Tom that came to look at my older sisters. I remember him yelling from out front and we went outside and here is our stepdad, my stepdad, a Vietnam vet out there beating the snot out of a welterweight semi-pro boxer in our front yard. I remember him having eight broken toes. And I remember that guy was wearing boots and jeans and my stepdad was out there in nothing but his underwear rolling around in stickers and was all scraped up and cut up. Why? Because it was a big event. It was a scary moment. I remember events from all the way back and I remember the day I got saved at nine years old sitting in front of 929 South Main Street, apartment number 224, sitting in the preacher's car. Our, my nephew had just died. And the preacher that did the funeral came back and witnessed to me for, now it would be the third time. He witnessed to me on the morning that Bradley died. He witnessed to me at the funeral. And then he witnessed to me on the following Saturday. And, and it, there was too much chaos going on. And I sat inside that preacher's big fancy Cadillac car. And he went over those verses one more time. And the dumb little fat kid got saved that morning because I trusted in Jesus Christ. Hey, friend. Do you remember getting saved? If not, I ain't trying to hurt your feelings, but did it even happen? Are you sure? Do you remember other stuff from around that time you supposedly got saved, but you don't remember God reaching down from heaven and snatching you out of the pits of hell and putting you on higher ground? You don't remember that? Did it happen? I hope it happened. If it did, we ought to thank God. God, God, the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, friend, he proved his love for us by sending Jesus to the cross. The way we prove our love to him is by serving him and being obedient. If you're here today and you don't know for sure that you're saved, I don't want you to drive away. I want you to stay and let us show you in the Bible how to be saved. But if you are saved... Friend, we've got a job to do. We've had it for a long time, and maybe we're running behind. We'll just have to run a little faster now. But it's time to flatten the curve. It's time to do right. It's time to tell the lost and dying world around us that there's a penalty for sin, and God will not bless them. God will not help them. God will not do anything from them until they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They'll bust hell wide open if they die without Christ. That's not being ugly, friend. That's being honest. That's being sincere. That's being godly and obedient to the Word of God. Whatever your situation, I want to encourage you to take action. If you're serving God and you are being faithful, well, hallelujah, make sure other people around you know it and set a good example and use your testimony. And thank you. Thank you. We do have people, a lot of people in our church that are faithful. They love the Lord and it shows. We sing that song as a kid. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, well, your life should surely show it. Listen, if you're saved and you know it, let's flatten the curve. Hey, if you're saved and you know it, let's flatten the curve. If you're saved and you know it, let's get away from the sin. Let's get away from the laziness. Let's get away from the awfulness. Let's get away from the darkness and step in the light and lead other people to Christ. Whatever the need, 
Only you and God know. But you mark it down, honey. You and God know. And if we refuse to, to, to respond, then you'll just have to live with that. And God will move on and use the next person and the next person. But it may be your friends and your family that don't get led to the Lord because of your sorriness. It'll be my friends and my family that won't get led to the Lord because of my sorriness. Hey, I'm telling you, we need to get busy for the Lord. We need to flatten the curve. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. And we, like Joshua, want to encourage people just to get up and get right and let's get on with it. Lord, they got rid of Achan. They got the sin out of the camp. And they got the camp out of sin. And they move forward victoriously. Lord, I pray that we would have a people and we would be a people and we would lead a people and we would encourage a people that would get away from our sin and get in the middle of your will. Lord, thank you for so, mu so much, Lord, for each one who drove out today. Some drove from long distances. And thank you for those around the country that are tuned in, yea, around the world. Father, there's a worldwide need. There's a nationwide need, a statewide need, a great need in our county, in our city, in our neighborhood, on our block, in our home. Father, please help us and bless us as we try to become the people that you absolutely want us to be. We don't want you to use somebody else. We want you to use us. While on others thou art calling, please do not pass me by. Lord, we love you. And I pray that as we have a, an invitation hymn, that maybe right where somebody sits, they might take a moment and try to get right with God. Lord, if it's for salvation, Lord, we want them to go ahead and step out of their car and come forward so we can show them in the Bible how to be saved and to know it. Lord, we want to be used, and we realize we have to be usable. We love you, and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving.